this is my um, the second time I've come to G5A. I'm just uh, really I love this space because you know it's got that intimacy and yet it's got uh, numbers. It can hold so many people. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. Asia Society and I are friends for many many years and uh, happy to be with first edition art also. And when they told me that I had to uh, talk to uh, my friend, TM Krishna, I immediately said no, because I thought he was going to talk about classical music and the season and the kacheri and the intricacies of Carnatic music. So I immediately said no, because I felt very inadequate. And then I read this book and I felt even more worried <laughs> because you have taken, uh, Krishna, you've taken these massive themes and encapsulated them in this. Um, this is a bit of a bombshell of a book, by the way. I, may, uh, I will request you, I will urge you to go and pick up a copy. It's a very easy but somewhat difficult read in the sense that it raises questions um, that we should be answering, and especially in the India of 2018, it's really a question that we must ask ourselves, why haven't we asked these questions all along? <clears throat> so it's a, a book that consistently, constantly through the pages when I was reading, I was saying, you know, this is such an important point and all that. Krishna, you've been writing about these things as a columnist, speaking in public forums about this and all that kind of thing. So is this more or less a summation of what you have been uh, thinking about all these years? Yeah, you could you could definitely say that. It also, I think this book, um, this is like a long essay, uh, does bring into it many of the things I've spoken about in patches, <coughs> um, in specificity, and in I've written about some of these aspects also. And <clears throat> to some extent, they also take off from a few chapters of my older book, uh, Southern Music, where I think um, that was more specific to one art form and my own personal engagement with that. But it all kind of, you know, expands from there. So yes, it is. But I think this book also has a lot of things that I've experienced over the last seven years in my search for not answers to these questions, shall we say, um, trying to understand the questions better. So whether it is my engagements with different musicians, different artists, activists, um, different sections of society, conversation, casual conversations, all this have enriched this book because all that has come from what I've learned from interacting with people. And uh, it has only further emphasized the point that you made of why are we not asking these questions. And I think I'm, I'm still asking the same question when I write the book. Uh, so much of it is you uh, thinking aloud of some of these issues, but you're also a practitioner in that sense of some of the theories, some of the ideas mm -hmm. you have come up with. Uh, we'll discuss those ideas in a minute, but you've also actually taken those theories out into the field, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, uh, I've said this many times, and I just want to reiterate that, that this whole, um, what are the questions, what are the questions that bother me, um, still bother me, or I raise in the book, or I ask of others, which incidentally means I'm asking of myself, uh, comes from my practice of music. That's my centering. Um, it all comes from what music does to me. And the question begins right there. And therefore, uh, when many of these things, these questions were raised, it was not about writing a column or speaking to people about it. It began with saying, OK, what do I do with the music that I sing? I mean, are there any, is there any room in the music that I sing to address these questions? Is there a way of looking at my music in a way that may be problematic for people, but yet kind of ask these questions. So actually, in one way, it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult position because it could mean, I'm happy it didn't, it could have meant that at some point I could have been totally disillusioned with the music that I was singing. That it was very highly probable that I found that this music, or and, and I want to say that I may be talking about Carnatic music, but this can be extrapolated to any art form. Um, it can be any field. So the question is, can these questions be addressed? If you address them, are you shaking some inner core of the art form? Uh, 
Um, is it still that art form if you ask these questions? So many of these things have come from practice, whether it is the way I, I perform or the compositions that I bring into concerts or um, the collaborations that have I have, uh, some of them have been accidentally bumped Even into. Even your audiences. Oh yeah, the audiences, the space, the whole idea that an art, any art or any human being is determined by space, context, uh, environment. And if you shift any one of those aspects, you shift people, you shift space, or you shift content, then something happens uh, that's quite marvelous, disturbing. And if it's not disturbing, it's not art. Uh, that's that's seriously my, my position. Something disturbing and something changes in the texture. And it also allows you to further investigate whether in that change in texture, art still exists. So it's, it's a fascinating um, process as a practitioner, let alone writing about it, to always wonder about this. Where is this moving? Is it moving? Am I moving? And um, I think if you don't do that, then this, you're just living in comfort of status quo. Yes, so uh, as I said, and I'm going to kind of um, articulate it in a slightly different way. Uh, it's a subversive thought in a sense. Also, it's subversive doubly so because you are from the inside and you are kind of imploding it from the inside, asking these questions. So let us, um, let us in a very reductionist way, let me talk about that question uh, yeah. in a simplistic way. And of course, we'll... Um, you'll talk about it, etc. You are saying that there is a citadel and that citadel has been entrenched for decades, centuries, generations and that citadel, uh, you could call it even an ecosystem yeah. which, which includes a certain uh, social order which includes a certain way of doing things and which includes tradition uh, which is a loaded word, as we know. But ultimately, that entire idea is exclusionary and it is created to keep out people. And it's time, according to what you are arguing, that that citadel was stormed uh, which has won you a lot of friends, I know that. <laughs> <In> the, <laughs> I read an article, somebody sent an article to say, here is one of Krishna's rants. So uh, that must be more. Uh, and you are basically talking about this, and to put it a little simply, Krishna, you are bringing down or challenging the Brahminical order. The only thing I'll add is I'll say there are citadels in plural. That's the only thing I'll add. Uh, there's not one citadel. I mean, I may refer to one citadel as the point where the question begins. And that's the citadel that I, am, I belong to. I belong to that citadel. Uh, but the fact is, every one of us in this room belong to different citadels. And uh, I think all those citadels operate in a very, very similar fashion across the globe. Um, and it is uh, very important to, I think, storm citadels. At the same time, I think what I'm also saying in the book is it's not just about the citadels. It's also about how, does, how do art forms and people and communities who don't belong to these citadels operate culture and art? What happens there? So there is something going on there too. That's the most important aspect of this conversation, actually. But the fact is, all of us are so worried about the Citadel, we don't care about that part of the conversation. For me, actually, that, that's something I've changed. Let me, let me be very honest here. When, I, when this whole this query began, it was about the music that I sang. This, now look, there is something very selfish about it, okay? Uh, okay, it's this music, it's trapped in the Citadel, we are all in the Brahminical order, it has to reach everybody. There's something evangelical also about it. Uh, you know, and in... I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm saying that's how I began in my, in my thought process. But then when you start investigating, you see how problematic that position is. Um, and in this book, I'm just going to take one example. I have written about this book, uh, in this book. So um, at Urur or Kot Kopam, for those who don't know, is a little fishing village in the city of Chennai. We, we do this festival, which could be called a subversive festival, that tries to bring communities and art forms into conversation 
um, allows for certain rubbing of shoulders that would not normally happen. And I'd invi- we had invited a friend. Uh, in the book, I don't mention it's in the Uru Alkot Kulpum, but now I have, unfortunately. Uh, we invited a friend to come and perform. And this friend said, yeah, sure, of course, a wonderful idea. We should perform. You know, Carnatic music should go to everybody. I said, yeah, okay. And then there was a Facebook post from this friend. Um, point one. I'm performing at Uru or Kotkupum for economically and culturally deprived people. <laughs> Point two. And I'm not, I'm, this is, I'm, I'm not verbatim, but I'm more or less encapsulating the post. Point two. Um, regular concert goers do not come. You will intimidate people. Point three. If you have similar people in your homes, you may send them. Uh, I think all of you understood what, what the post is, right? I was infuriated. I mean, I can't even explain how angry I was. I would have, I would have throttled that guy. I swear it. He's a dear friend too. And you know, and I, I, I explore those those positions and in the book. And let, let's keep that aside. So the point I'm trying to make here is the presumption that are, that there is not much sophisticated or beautiful culture. There are some exotic items, you know. All these things are exotic items where they'll say, oh, look, this happens here in the back streets. They're not respectable. You're not going to bring them to G5A. Sorry. You know what I mean. You know what I mean, right? No, in fact, uh, in fact, that's a little... Uh, I'm going to just... No, no, you can, I'll finish. Yeah, okay. I mean, G5A was just a name. So I'm just, no, just, no, no, I... I, I mean, I, I just speaking. used it because looking at the audience here. But my point is... No. <laughs> This audience, this Come on, audience, man, we're all the same. You're sitting in the room. Let's be honest about it, at least for this evening. You know? uh, this audience might welcome that, you know. I mean, yeah, but let's, let's, no, let's be very honest about this, Siddharth. And I'll be honest for myself, too. We will welcome it. I'm not saying anybody's going to reject it. But let's look at how we perceive it. I think it's something that we who belong to Citadels need to think about. We will welcome it. I'm saying nobody's going to reject it. But there are a lot of buts that will come in in our heads. And I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying it's wrong. It's natural that it happens. It's very natural. But it's also important that we question those buts. We question those ideas of what is great art. We question those ideas, what is sophisticated, what is crude, what is rudimentary. You know, I'm just saying, let's just think about it. I'm not saying, I'm not passing judgment. I'm, with all this conversation I'm having now, I still feel the same way. I still have the, those kind of feelings. So the point I'm trying to say is that the, as much as we need to address citadels, we also need to address the fact that cultures and art forms among communities that don't naturally belong to these citadels are quite incredibly diverse, sophisticated, um, you know, so complex, vibrant. And I'm saying this, when we talk about art, we're talking about people. And if you look at the art forms that are neglected, they belong to people who are neglected. And that's not a coincidence. That means there is something really screwed up. Uh, you know, uh, this, this brings me to one of the points that kept on kind of hitting me. And that is that there have been occasions, certainly from what little I know about Carnatic culture and music and dance, that that, that art form as it were, from the ground up, has moved up. Now the question is, after having moved up, was there genuine um, kind of interaction? Or did it then become part? um, So even when it's absorbed, let's say culturally appropriated, to use a fashionable word. uh, It's an appropriate word, (laughs) not just fashionable. (laughs) Even when that happens, it gets sucked out, and then that gets left behind. That, that's the pro, that's that's and the com- that's happened. That's the complexity, right? You know, um, there's there's no simple answer to that. That's true. I mean, it's a question of power. It's cultural power and aesthetic power of some sort. And it's true that uh, when you have ideas that come from uh, communities of people who don't belong to a higher power structure, the ideas are taken, uh, and to a, after a point, there is a certain mod you know, modification done, identities are kind of erased. And yeah, this is deeply problematic. But actually, the big, you know, if you address it aesthetically, forget about the sociopolitics. I think the biggest problem in that is that it doesn't allow the art to grow also. 
Now, if the art form allowed for that diverse identity to remain, or the people who bring that, to be able to hold that with pride and present that as part of, say, high culture within courts, then it becomes very interesting discourse even within high culture. But unfortunately, that does not happen. What happens is naturally the, the personality, the person, uh, the, the ideas are in a way appropriated, modified. And since you use the word, if there's a Brahminical order, then made sure the Brahminical order find it acceptable. And somewhere then it's lost. And what is even worse is if the person comes from a community that does not belong to the order, that person is used like one flag to say, hey, look, we are very inclusive. See, this person has made it. And it's so gross. I mean, I mean, I, there can't be anything worse. So, than you know, I was, I was also quite uh, impressed and amazed with some of the granular detail you've come up with uh, when you are, uh, you've really thought this through and you're a very angry man, by the way. Uh, but, uh, there, you know, there's a level of detail that the girl has to wear a half sari and if the boy is like this and yeah. everyone is very somber and the divinities, that is the composers, look down from the walls yeah. and the guru I, I've is, been told uh, now that I've been cursed by all of them. So I don't get any blessings from any of the divine composers anymore. Well, so. you came from that order. But I've sense. lost it all. So <laughs> <laughs> No, so, so you are essentially saying that this is uh, deeply undemocratic. Deep, this is deeply inclu uh, exclusionary. And um, also, in a sense, giving a kind of a manifesto to say, high time we break it. Yeah, I mean... But it's hidebound. So are you barking up the wrong tree? Well, I don't know. I hope I'm not. But the point is, like, many of these things are so naturally done. You know, it's not like everybody is, like, having an agenda and saying, come on, my classroom is like this because I want to promote this. No. I mean, it's very naturally done. You know, the classroom is very naturally. If the girls are sitting and don't wear a puttu, one person picks up the puttu and says, wear a puttu, you're in part of class. Now, nobody thinks that there's a whole, this whole conversation should not be happening. You know? And again, I said, this is Carnatic environment, but it's there in every environment. It's in every situation, the same thing of a different kind of order will come. And very important aspect here is that the targets 99% of the time are women and girls, not boys. You know, so they represent this so-called culture in this fashion more than even the purification. The boys. Yeah, I think yeah, of you've course, said it is. Somewhere. It is the idea of. So, can this change? I mean, am I barking up the wrong tree? I don't know, but I think the change is not a singular thing. It's not about just changing the classroom. It's about. I think it's about the practice itself. What am I singing? Why am I singing? Uh, can the audiences change? Can the performers change? Can different ideas of society and even religion, I'm, you know, even ideas of religion have to change. Even Rama Krishna has to have different notions of Rama Krishna and not just the Brahminical notion of Rama Krishna. If this happens, then I think a lot of things, these things generationally will go to the classroom. It'll change the conversation. If I have a classroom, I mean, it's like pub, it's like schooling in India. Uh, I was just at a conference on peace in education. We were having this whole co conversation: what happens in in public schools or not, I mean, India's public schools, but schools in general. The whole idea that there's so much homogeneity in the way you know private schools operate. Um, a simple thing of a diversity of a classroom can change the conversation and learning in a con classroom. Diversity in an art classroom will change the conversation. But for that to happen, a lot of things have to change. Content has to be questioned. And all those deified composers need to be challenged. Celebrated yet challenged. And then you can create an interesting discourse that could probably change the texture of the art and the communities that you're, you're speaking about. So I don't think I'm barking up the wrong tree, but it may take two generations for even 5% of what I'm speaking to so come about. So actually by saying actually, which you have said, and I marked it here, uh, that uh, Tyagraja needs to be con uh, contested. Yes. And questioned. 100%. I have no uh, doubts about that. You must have driven a lot of people. Oh, yeah. It, it, I mean, the, of course, people are very upset that I said Tyagar. I think he needs to be challenged. I'll celebrate this man as one of the greatest ever composers that India has had, no doubt. But the ideas of Tyagarajas need to be questioned? Yes. Why? Um, of course, we understand that the social, political context of his times, his own upbringing were different. But if you're going to accept in 2018 
ideas that he has stated as to be uh, verbatim accepted as some gospel on gender and caste and society, then I think it needs to be questioned in 2018. Uh, I, it'll, uh, we need this everywhere. We need every one of them questioned because I think we need diverse voices. We need, we need people asking quite difficult questions on society, on caste, on gender and wonder why we are not like that. And even aesthetically, there are complex questions that need to be asked, but that's a different, that's a different platform. But yes, they need to be. It doesn't mean you stop singing Tyagaraja. It doesn't mean you stop singing Dikshitar. It means that imagine a concert where you have two different perspectives of one idea from two different sections of society presented. The idea is enriched. We are enriched. And why are we so afraid of doing that? I don't even understand what the problem in this is. I don't even see a problem. No, no, the problem is quite obvious. I mean, uh, the problem is that uh, you are uh, challenging uh, generations, as I said, of thought. Uh, but uh, ultimately, the question that may arise to the people you are challenging, uh, throwing this challenge to, is to say an entire world order is coming to an end. You're challenging civilizational positions. You're not merely saying, L let's try that. Uh, no, no, I agree. I mean, yeah, I think they have to. do. do that's, I mean, this whole churning has to happen. This churning of all our positions, churning of all our identities has to happen. If it does not happen, we become such a dry... You know, there's, this whole, there's something so feudal about all of us. You know, I mean, this whole, I, we all live in this feudal kind of an order. And these churnings will question those feudal orders. And I think it's high time we, as uh, you know, we are what, five now, according to our present state, we will be a 10,000 year old, uh, much, more, much, much more, is it? Much. Okay, 40, at 000? least half a million. Okay, half a million year old. Okay. Uh, and that's the time when uh, there were uh, rockets. And oh, plastics. yeah, yeah. Sorry, there were rockets and there were all kinds of things happening. I think there was also Twitter, right? Okay. And today I found out that I thought I was a, a journalist, but the journalists were there a long time ah, ago. Exactly, yeah. So considering all that, I think uh, this is the time these questions are even more necessary. Otherwise, this nonsense that we are, we are kind of passing around is just going to carry on. We need to celebrate our, our cultures, no doubt. We need to celebrate our traditions. But everything in plural one, not singular. And when we, the whole idea of celebration means that it needs to revive itself. It needs to be alive. It needs to be breathing, which means these citadels, these constructions, these civilizational orders, which are all man-made. And, and I say man-made in a very patriarchal sense because that's exactly what it is. And these need to be moved. And I think it's not about art. You know, art is, is a very fascinating thing. Um, because uh, that's a great avenue to people. It's a great avenue to understand people. That's a great avenue to also influence people, to change people. And if you don't do that, then I don't know. You know, we're all just sticking to habituations. And if you're comfortable with that, I don't know what to say. So, Krishna, I'm going to uh, play devil's advocate and ask you a kind of... Uh, uh, you must have been asked this before, but I... You're, you're, going, to, you're going to write a T.M. Krishna slam piece. No, but okay. I'm not. I don't feel, I don't feel uh, adequate enough to do it. But I'm going to ask you one question. Is there a danger of over-sentimentalizing over the subaltern? It's a very good point. Um, yeah, there is. No doubt. Uh, it is in itself perhaps patronizing. That's what I was going to say. I don't want to bring that yet. Okay. But, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So that's that's something I was going to say, but I'll, I'll keep... Yes, there is that danger um, that you over-sentimentalize it. But at the same time, I think before you get to that stage of sentimentalizing it, I think it is, a, first of all, can socially we allow the subaltern and the non-subaltern to interact with each other on equal footing. That's all. Can it happen? Uh, can there be a conversation? And I can tell you it's not easy. Uh, it seems all idealistic when you say you have conversations across social spectrum that are equal. They're never equal. That is sentimentalizing. If I sentimentalize that and think just because I share a stage with a musician or a dancer from a subaltern community, uh, I have somehow created this dialogue that is 
has equity, that's a lie. Uh, all I can do is I can uh, problematize the conversation and make sure I problematize it so much that it creates that whole disturbance for myself and for the other person in that conversation. So the sentimentalization happens when you're not willing to problematize the whole conversation. And I think as long as you're constantly willing to do that, then that's not a problem. This, I, and also I think sentimentalization is a kind of uh, bigger problem because like you said, it's also patronizing. Um, it's also some way forced upon to some extent. Where is the conversation happening from the, uh, from the people who own these arts, own these cultures? It's their voice. What is the conversation you're having when you say you want to give a stage, you want to perform in mainstream or the proscenium or whatever? What is it? What is this? What is the art that they have? What do they want to perform? Do they want to have this conversation? And the unevenness is inherent. How are you going to address the unevenness? I think to keep all this alive, when you have a conversation with, shall we say, the title subaltern, then I think there's no problem. If you don't keep that alive, and if a person like me is involved in a subaltern conversation, it's deeply problematic right away. And I'll concede it first. It's deeply problematic because I'm every privilege you talk about, and I'm talking about subaltern. That itself is not so, just talking, but also practicing. I mean, that's, that makes it basically. So it is. So it's a danger, but I think it's a danger that you need to kind of face and look at it and learn from it. I'm, I fall off. I, I've fallen on my face a couple of times. I have made mistakes. I have not understood. But yet the conversation has to go on. I mean, you can't run away from the conversation just because you know that there are dangers in that conversation. So, in fact, at one place, I felt that you were saying that it's not may not be a good idea to openly say, uh, "Let me absorb your culture and use it." It's not okay at all. Yeah. See, so why I was quite interested in that. Uh, so, yeah, this is this is a very interesting. I mean, I, I speak about identities. I think before that, um, you know. While you talk about the citadel, you're always talking about smudging identities. You're talking about breaking the Brahminical identity in this case, or whatever identities. But I think as you move down the social order, uh, the role of identity changes, and we have to be very aware of it. And identity on, on the, in the lower spectrum of the unfortunate social order actually needs to be empowered. It actually needs to be given power from within the community and who else is interacting in the community to allow it to challenge everything else that exists. There's no question of smudging that identity there. That's offensive and violent. So if I was going to go and learn, for example, an art form um, that's so-called subaltern, um, what does it do? I, it's, it's such a complicated situation. Um, when I go learn the art form, Am I just taking the art form and then performing it in stages that I already have access to? Uh, what happens to the singers who are singing or the dancers who are dancing that art form for generations? What is my interaction with the larger community there? Um, so these are all questions that the people in so power are you need still to an ask. outsider? Of course you are. And does that matter? No, why should you? I mean, why do you want to become an insider? Why do you want to become an insider? That is so, that is, that, is, that is the problem. You have to realize you're an outsider. You have to learn from that interaction. Where you are an insider, you have to learn to be an outsider and understand the outside position. Where you're an outsider, you don't understand the insider's position, but still stay outside. You need to be able to flip both in both situations. So in the Carnatic world, I'm a complete insider. I'm born and brought up in, in that world. But I'm still an insider if I critique. That's never going to run away. Just because uh, people find me an outsider does not mean I'm, I'm not an, in, I'm an outsider. No, I can still walk into every Carnatic space as I own it, and I still own it. That's privilege. But to be constantly aware of that, that is staying alive. No, so therefore, what what uh, tends to happen, what could happen is that that world will look at you as this oddball gadfly and move on. Well, that's and say, complete. here's the maverick. Yeah, say God, those he words wants. are so convenient, isn't it? Yeah, let him say whatever he wants. He's one of us, 
and he'll come back to the fold. So I think they believe that for a while, but they've given up on me. But uh, on the jokes apart, yes, that's a possibility. Um, that you know, you called an iconoclast, you're called a maverick, or whatever, you know, and those words are usually given to people who are asking different difficult questions, either aesthetically or non aesthetically, in different fashions, or any field for that matter. Um, but I somehow feel that when people start listening to those conversations, and people start responding to those conversations, the very fact that people are constantly responding to what you call my provocations, means that there is something going on. That these cannot be ignored. They don't need to agree with me. Not necessary at all. So I do think that, at least now I'd like to believe that, uh, though, I am, though I may be still considered an oddball, that these conversations are not going to end with me. But that's, see, this is that, I'm, I'm just being on. This is also a trap within a trap, right? Um, can these conversations, how much of these conversations are about T.M. Krishna and how much of these conversations are about the issues? Um, if you take T.M. Krishna out of the conversation, will the issues still be there? I don't have an answer to that. That's a trap. And that's a trap I've laid for myself. I know. Um, but I don't know. But I think one, one thing I can be very sure about is that the conversation now is so much out there that nobody can run away from it. I think everybody realizes the conversation is now on the table for everybody to see. Has it Within, been picked up? Yes, I think the next generations are picking it up. And I think it's an, I have an immense faith in the next generation. Um, because I've said this many times, because I think they're picking up these conversations. Um, I think they have a, a fairly different sense of community than even my generation to a large extent. And, I'm not figuring out why, but they do. And uh, I think that they are picking up these questions. They are wondering about it. They are, they are trying different things. They are experimenting their own way. Some of them come and send a link to me and say, okay, what do you think? But I know a lot of them, many of them don't agree with me, but they still come and battle the question with me. So I really think that there are generations come after us who are, have found these questions important. Uh, and I don't think anybody can run away from it. They can run away from me and my proclamations, but they can't run away from the issues that have been generated through this conversation. And I'm fairly confident about that. Two, two things, two, two of your chapters are uh, titled um, uh, Art in the Class, I think. Mm -hmm. And of course, you have a wonderful chapter called uh, Cast. Uh, which uh, is the one I went to straight away, by the way. Uh, art in the class and then reshaping art. So, is there an action plan or are you still in the... I think many of the things that I've uh, uh, tried to do in terms of from inside the art or from extension of conversations are part of the reshaping, reshaping idea. Whether it's the collaborations, whether it is the learnings, whether it is the changing the idea of what we perform, space, are all things that have come about from this idea of reshaping. Um, and I think slowly they are, do have a trickle effect and I can see other people doing different other things and more interesting things. And I think there is a movement, not just in terms of intellectual conversation, but also in terms of you know, praxis that is happening. And I think, I think there is a directional shift. Uh, but again, these are, like you said, these are generational orders. I mean, it takes a lot of times, time for anything to move. But I think a lot of small things are happening beyond what I am engaging in. Um, that uh, tell me that yes, reshaping is something that is possible. And why reshape art for me? It's it's the larger question. It is about society and community. It's not just about you know Carnatic music or Lavani or about Ghana or anything. It is a larger question about people and human beings. Um, and I think um, all these little, little interactions that we create, all these cross-wirings that we do, all these uh, subversive ideas that people have come up with. And the other day I saw a clipping of this, these girls in Delhi who are doing Bharatanatyam on the street. Uh, I thought it's a fabulous idea. And uh, uh, they just go to any street corner or anywhere and just dance. Um, it may seem simple and even whimsical. But I think all these things have interesting interesting 
no, things happening. And these are young girls. And I think the, all these things do interesting things to the way we perceive our body, we perceive our, our identities, where we perceive space, uh, private, public, uh, pure, not pure, all these things. So I think there are fascinating reshaping projects that are happening across. So actually space, um, I mean, we'll kind of wind up on that, but space is the most important thing I felt uh, because uh, space uh, challenges so many things. And now there is uh, digital space. Oh, yeah. So that's going to challenge uh, many more assumptions, many more conventions and all that kind of thing. So really speaking, reshaping art is an idea which, which is there in front of us. And uh, it's... a uh, it's an idea kind of before its time or about time that this idea came because there's nothing as important as, as you said, reshaping art and reshaping society through it. That's what you're saying, is that's, it? That's, that's, that, that, is, that is what I'm saying ultimately. Yeah. So I think art is a great avenue uh, to change the way we see ourselves and see each other, which is why art exists. Otherwise, there's no role for art. Art changes the way you see or feel. You, you feel you feel differently through art. You see differently through art. Your identity is different through the experience of art, which means the whole othering is also something that art should directly change. And so it's about people. It's about communities. And I think reshaping art is about reshaping the way we make community. It's about reshaping hierarchical systems. I mean, the fact is it's never going to go away. We are always going to have some order in place. A friend of mine sent me a mail, said, what is this, you write all this thing. If one order goes, another one is going to come. What's the point? You know, this is fair. Of course, if this order goes, some other order will come. We are, we are pattern recognizers. The only reason the species survived is because we recognize patterns in our, between ourselves in the sky. So we're going to recognize patterns. Male is a pattern. Female is a pattern. Brahmin is a pattern. Dalit is a pattern. They're all patterns. But if you don't constantly subvert and question every one of those patterns, then we just remain where we are. New orders will come. We'll reshape them. This is why art is so important. Because they carry patterns. They can confuse patterns. They can trigger new patterns. And if you don't see art as a reformulator of idea of pattern itself, then art has no role in society. So uh, I wish we could go on. Small book, but there's so much more. So the song is about an environmental issue, um, but it also I'm not going to go into the details, but also raises very important questions on um, ideas of purity, ideas of content, um, ideas of commonality. The word Purambuk itself means commons, so probably fills the space. And the six ragas I sang are the six ragas in this composition. Mm, உனக்க இல்ல பொறம்போக்கு எனக்கு இல்ல பொறம்போக்கு ஊருக்க பொறம்போக்கு பூமிக்கு பொறம்போக்கு உனக்கு இல்ல பொறம்போக்கு எனக்கு இல்ல பொறம்போக்கு ஊருக்க பொறம்போக்கு பொறம்போக்கு உனக்கு இல்ல பொறம்போக்கு எனக்கு இல்ல பொறம்போக்கு ஊருக்கு பொறம்போக்கு பூமிக்கு பொறம்போக்கு உனக்கு இல்ல பொறம்போக்கு எனக்கு இல்ல பொறம்போக்கு ஊருக்கு பொறம்போக்கு பூமிக்கு பொறம்போக்கு 
உன் பொறுப்பு பொறம்பாக்கு என் பொறுப்பு பொறம்பாக்கு உன் பொறுப்பு பொறம்பாக்கு என் பொறுப்பு பொறம்பாக்கு ஊர் பொறுப்பு இயற்கைக்கு பூமிக்கு பொறம்பாக்கு உன் பொறுப்பு பொறம்பாக்கு என் பொறுப்பு பொறம்பாக்கு ஊர் பொறுப்பு இயற்கைக்கு பூமிக்கு சாமகாரி கோமாப்பா சாணி சாமகாரி சா கோமாப்பா சனி சமகாரி சாபதனி தபதமாகரி சாக வெள்ளம் வந்து போன பின்ன கத்துட்டது என்ன வெள்ளம் வந்து போன பின்ன வெள்ளம் வந்து போன பின் வெள்ளம் வந்து போன பின் வெள்ளம் வந்து போன பின் கத்துட்டது என்ன ஏறி குள்ள கட்டட கட்டுறது வெள்ளம் வந்து கத் கத்துட்டது என்ன ஏறி குள்ள கட்டட கட்டுறது என்ன மழ தண்ணி கடலுக்கு வழியிறையடத்துல மழ தண்ணி கடலுக்கு வழியிறையடத்துல காங்கிரி கட்டடம் தேவையா கண் மழ தண்ணி கடலுக்கு வழியிறையடத்துல காங்கிரீட் கட்டடம் தேவையா கண் சாணி பதவ சாசகாரி மாகபாமதாப சாமகபாமதாப மாபகாமரேச பாமதா முன்னகரத்துக்குள்ள நதிகள் ஓடல முன்னகரத்துக்குள்ள நதிகள் நகரத்துக்குள்ள நதிகள் ஓடல நதிகள் சுத்திதான் நகரம் வளர்ந்துச்சு மழ தண்ணிய காத்திருந்த ஏரிக்கு மழ தண்ணிய காத்திருந்த ஏரிக்கு போரம்போக்கு பேர் இருந்துச்சு மழ தண்ணிய காத்திருந்த ஏரிக்கு போரம்போக்கு பேர் இருந்துச்சு மாகபாமதாபச தபச நிரி சமாகபாமரி சதாப மபதாபாமரி என் ஊரில் மின் நிலையம் கட்டினது பின்ன என் ஊரில் மின் நிலையம் கட்டினது பின் என் ஊரில் மின் நிலையம் கட்டினது பின்னே ஆத்துல ஆயிரமேக்கர் சாம்பலாம் கண்ண கடலையும் நதியையும் பிரிச்சு வச்சான் கடலையும் நதியையும் பிரிச்சு வச்சான் 
ಬೆಳ್ಳವಾನತ್ತ ಕರು ಪಡಿ ಚಾನ್ ಬೆಳ್ಳವಾನತ್ತ ಕರು ಪಡಿ ಚಾನ್ ನೀದಪ ಮಗರಿ ರಿ ಸರಿ ಮಾರಿ ನೀದಪ ಮಗರಿ ರಿ ಸರಿ ಮಾರಿ ನಿಧಪ ಮ ಪದ ಪ ಮ ಪ ಗಾರಿ ಸನಿ ದಸ ಎನ್ನೂರಲ ಸಂಜು ಮುಡಿಚ ಉನ್ನೂರಲ ಸೇಯವರುವನ್ ಎನ್ನೂರಲ ಸಂಜು ಮುಡಿಚ ಉನ್ನೂರಲ ಸೇಯವರುವನ್ ಎನ್ನೂರಲ ಸಂಜು ಮುಡಿಚ ಉನ್ನೂರಲ ಸೇಯವರುವನ್ ಕೇಳ್ವಿ ಕೇಟ ಮೇಕ್ ನಿಂಡಿಯಾನ್ ವಡ ಸುಡುವನ್ ಕೇಳ್ವಿ ಕೇಟ ಮೇಕ್ ನಿಂಡಿಯಾನ್ ವಡ ಸುಡುವನ್ ಕೇಳ್ವಿ ಕೇಟ ಮೇಕ್ ನಿಂಡಿಯಾನ್ ವಡ ಸುಡುವನ್ ಸಾನಿದ ಸರಿ ಮಾಗರಿ ಸಾ ನೀದ ಪಮ್ಮ ಪದ ಪಮ್ಮ ಪ ಗಾರಿ ಸನಿ ರಿ ಸ ಮಾದ ಗ ಮಾಧ ಪ ಗಾರಿ ಸನಿ ರಿ ಸ ಅಳರ್ಚಿ ವೇಲೈ ವಾಯ್ಪ ಎಲ್ಲ ಬೆಟ್ಟಿ ಸಾಕ 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 ಅಳರ್ಚಿ ವೇಲೈ ವಾಯ್ಪ ಎಲ್ಲ ಬೆಟ್ಟಿ ಸಾಕ ಏರಿ ವಿತ್ತವನಕ್ಕೆ ಏರಿ ವೆರುಂ ಪೊರಂಬೋಕ್ ಅಳರ್ಚಿ ವೇಲೈ ವಾಯ್ಪ ಎಲ್ಲ ಬೆಟ್ಟಿ ಸಾಕ ಏರಿ ವಿತ್ತವನಕ್ಕ ಏರಿ ವೆರುಂ ಪೊರಂಬೋಕ್ ಅಪ್ಪುನೀಯುಂ ನಾನು ಎನ್ನ ಕಣಕ ಅಪ್ಪುನೀಯುಂ ನಾನು ಎನ್ನ ಕಣಕ ಅಡನೀಯುಂ ನಾನು ಪೋರಂಬೋಕ್ ಅಡನೀಯುಂ ನಾನು ಪೋರಂಬೋಕ್ ನಾನ ಪೊರಂಬೋಕ್ ನಾನ ಪೊರಂಬೋಕ್ ನಾನ ಪೊರಂಬೋಕ್ ನೀ ಪೊರಂಬೋಕ ಪೊರಂಬೋಕ್ ಉನಕ್ ಇಲ್ಲ ಪೊರಂಬೋಕ್ ಎನಕ್ ಇಲ್ಲ ಪೊರಂಬೋಕ್ ಊರಕ್ ಪೊರಂಬೋಕ್ ಭೂಮಿಕ್ ಪೊರಂಬೋಕ್ ಉನಕ್ ಇಲ್ಲ ಪೊರಂಬೋಕ್ ಎನಕ್ ಇಲ್ಲ ಪೊರಂಬೋಕ್ ಊರಕ್ ಪೊರಂಬೋಕ್ ಭೂಮಿಕ್ ಪೊರಂಬೋಕ್ ಉನಕ್ ಇಲ್ಲ ಪೊರಂಬೋಕ್ ಎನಕ್ ಪೊರಂಬೋಕ್ ಊರಕ್ ಪೊರಂಬೋಕ್ ಭೂಮಿಕ್ ಪೊರಂಬೋಕ್ ಊರಕ್ ಪೊರಂಬೋಕ್ ಭೂಮಿಕ್ ಪೊರಂಬೋಕ್ ಊರಕ್ ಪೊರಂಬೋಕ್ for those who may want to know what it said i didn't want to interrupt while singing um the word it's a play on the word porambok and porambok is a very commonly used abuse word in tamil uh it's very commonly used on the street every film will have at least one person calling a person porambok It basically means you're a good-for-nothing, useless person. 
Um, so it's interesting that a word that means commons uh, turned and became an abuse word to mean good for nothing, not useful for anything. So it also goes back to the idea, idea of uh, Poromboku was the commons, the grazing lands, the marshlands, the mangroves, the rivers, the lakes that people shared, communities shared and nobody had ownership over it. Um, at some point of time it became understood by the British as revenueless land because they couldn't get revenue from the land because it was common land. So revenueless land became useless land and uh, therefore not only is the land or the river useless, the people living around the places also become useless and which means the rivers can be abused, the lakes can be abused, the people living there can be ignored. So it's a, it's a, it's a cultural, it's interesting how a word uh, also signifies a cultural phenomena, an economic phenomena, a socially discriminating phenomena. This song directly addresses a problem in the northern part of Chennai, which is called Ennur, where we have about three or four thermal power stations. Obviously, they're situated in the place where the most marginalized live. Uh, one of Chennai's biggest dump yards is also not very far away. And uh, their river, uh, Kosastaliar River, is completely destroyed. Uh, there is a Kamaraja port coming up, which is basically takes over all the mangroves and the river land. Uh, fishing is completely affected, health issues. So it's, it's, a, it's actually a disaster zone. So this song directly addresses that disaster, but it also addresses the idea of Purumbok and why we need to reclaim it culturally also. We reclaim the idea that we share things. Um, to the specifics of the song, it starts by saying Purumbok belongs to nobody. It belongs to nature, you and me. Responsibility lies in all of us. And it also addresses the flood, the, the famous Chennai flood. Uh, what did we learn from the floods? Uh, you should not build buildings in a lake. Um, and this song, like with Chennai Tamil, which has a lot of English in it, this song also has English in it, and the word concrete comes in. Why, did you, why would you build concrete buildings inside a lake? Um, it goes on, I'm not going to go every, every, and it goes on to describe how communities and civilizations were built around lakes, not in lakes or in rivers, as we have done today the whole real estate mafia and um, of course this, the line for which people laughed uh, needs explanation uh, well one part of it was very obvious make in India uh, which is of course uh, the infamous slogan that we hear um, but there is one term there that even Tamilians don't know Vada Sodrade most people who have not grown up in Chennai will or who left Chennai in 1955-60s will have no clue of this word. Uh, vada Sudrada literally means frying vadas. But the import is lying and cheating. So if anybody in Chennai say Vada Sudrada, it means don't fit, don't give me a lie. So if the, the line goes basically, if, peop, um, if you ask them uh, why they are doing all this, uh, basically, yeah. Basically, it says that they'll finish in Endor and then come to your home. They'll come to where you're staying. And if you ask them questions, they will say, oh, all this is part of Make in India plans. And they will lie to you. That's what the line says. Of course, it ends in a, what I think is a melancholic note, where it says that it's always job opportunities that are presented as benefits from these things. Um, so it ends by saying, you are a Poramboka and I'm a Poramboka. We are all Porumbokas. That's the import of the song. To receive instant updates on all videos from The Wire, click the subscribe button and hit the bell icon. Pay to support independent journalism. Click the link in the description and choose the amount you want to pay.